In this video, I'd like to discuss the differences in the surgical management of two types of patients with intermittent cataract. One, an intermittent cataract that occurs very early in life, something like a traumatic cataract in this 18-year-old patient, as well as the second, which is an intermittent cataract in a 60-year-old. Let's see how both these cases differ. We start with the first case, which is an intermittent traumatic cataract in an 18-year-old male patient. This young patient presented a week after sustaining blunt trauma to his eye with an appearance like this. And as you can see, we have a total cataract. We start the surgery with the meticulous construction of the incisions. Now, when dealing with the total cataract, it's extremely important to take adequate time to stain the anterior capsule with blue dye to allow for adequate visibility during the creation of the rexes. Limited visibility in a case like this itself could compromise the capsular rexes. In cases of an intermittent cataract, I always use a cohesive or dispersive viscoelastic to flatten the anterior capsule. We now start with the double rexes. The initial nick in the anterior capsule is made like a small circular C with the help of a well-fashioned cystitone. Having progressed a little further, with the help of intraocular forceps, I now proceed to complete this half opening into a tiny circular rexus. Having done that, the excessive viscoelastic is removed, after which the cortical material is washed out to decompress the capsular bag. Being such a soft cataract, most of the cataract, as you can see, has come out itself. Once more, I insufflate some dispersive viscoelastic into the eye, and with the help of a cystome, as you can just see, I made a tangential nick. Then, with the help of an intraocular forceps, one of the tone edges of this chair is now held. Whilst the eye is being well supported with the help of a limb's forceps, and then I proceed to create a second circular rexus larger than the first, which will allow me to complete my phaco emulsification procedure with ease. Intermittently, I hold, I re grasp, I release, and re hold and propagate the tear suitably to get the opening of the size I want. I always like to do it under a dispersive viscoelastic and with the help of a microrexis forceps introduced through the sideboard incision so as to not lose any anterior chamber which would be a distinct possibility if I were to use a utratus through the main incision. Now as you can see I've completed the rexes. I now proceed with a bimanual irrigation aspiration to actually aspirate the rest of this soft cataract which has occurred as a result of trauma in this young patient. I prefer a bimanual irrigation aspiration always because I believe it actually helps with the circumferential removal of the cortex with significant ease. Having aspirated the cataract and the cortex, I now proceed to the implantation of the single-piece monofocal IOL in the capsular bag. Having implanted the IOL in the bag and achieved a horizontal orientation, I now proceed to remove the rest of the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber as well as from around the IOL. Following the completion of the visco wash, all the wounds are hydrated. This then brings us to the end of the surgery. Let's now move to examining the second case. This is a patient who presented to us with a senile nucleosclerosis and presented like an intumescent, dense, mature cataract. As always, meticulous care and attention to detail is always taken while making these incisions. As I mentioned earlier, there can be no compromise in staining these anterior capsules with blue dye. I'd like to just show you how I do it. 
at our center, we actually aspirate a little bit of blue dye into a 1cc tubeculin syringe and draw it out a little more, leaving some air in the anterior part of the syringe. And when we turn it around, you can see that the air does not get displaced by the blue dye. In this manner, we are able to inject the air into the anterior chamber first, under which we try to drop in the blue dye so as it spreads over and optimally stains the anterior capsule. As mentioned earlier, a cohesive or a dispersive viscoelastic is always used to flatten the anterior capsule to aid in the capsular excess. Another important consideration is the optimal creation of a perfect cystotome. I prefer it to be done under the microscope and I'll always look at the tip to ascertain that there has been no damage to the tip whilst making it. We now proceed with the double rexes. Now look as I try to make that initial circular cut. There's obviously some milky fluid that's coming out. Now this itself hampers visibility. So I need to go back into the eye, remove that fluid and inject some more dispersive viscoelastic into the anterior chamber to flatten the anterior capsule. Having done that, like in the previous case with the help of an intraocular forceps, I proceed to convert this half tear into a small circular opening in the anterior capsule. Having achieved this, I now remove some of the heavy duty viscoelastic from the anterior chamber and I wash out some of the cortical material with the view of decompressing the capsular bag prior to proceeding with making the second turn in the capsular excess. Whilst washing out this cortical material, we have to ensure that we don't accidentally injure the anterior capsule and then it would lead to a new challenge as to how to manage this cataract through a torn anterior capsule. Once more, some more dispersive viscoelastic is introduced into the anterior chamber to flatten the anterior capsule and the cystome is reintroduced and after making a tear in the anterior capsular edge, an intraocular forceps is now reintroduced into the anterior chamber, holds on to one edge of the tear and now proceeds to enlarge this opening into a suitably sized larger excess. In almost all cases of intermittent cataract, because the anterior chamber has been decompressed, I do not perform a hydrodissection procedure. We proceed directly with the downsizing and the emulsification of this nucleus using the direct chop technique. I use the burst mode to impale to get a good hold of the nucleus, whilst my long chopper now mechanically divides the nucleus into two heminuclei. In this manner, each heminucleus is then subsequently downsized and when we've got an adequate number of smaller emulsifiable fragments, each fragment is then drawn up into the pupillary safe zone, downsized further and emulsified. This is what you will see in this part of the surgery. With this, we come to the end of the nucleus emulsification. I attempt and then I'm successful in managing to remove some of the epinucleus with the FACO probe in the epinucleus mode itself. The minuscule amount of residual cortex is then removed with a bimanual irrigation aspiration. This is followed by the introduction of the single-piece monofocal IOL in the capsular bag. As always, the excess viscoelastic is now removed from the anterior chamber and from in and around the IOL. The wounds are then hydrated and this then brings us to the end of the second case. 
I hope you found this video tutorial wherein we analyzed the differences in the management of an intumescent cataract, both in a young and an old patient, useful. Thank you.